Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. I'd like to share a couple stories with you, if I might. As a child with polio, living in Washington, DC, the conventional wisdom of the time was that all children with disabilities, any kind of disability, would go to school together. Now, wouldn't that be fun? My parents didn't believe this was the correct wisdom. And I didn't either. And fortunately, I was allowed to go to a regular school. And I think that's made a lot of difference in my life. Another piece of wisdom they didn't kind of ascribe to was how to take care of a child with a disability. Oftentimes, I like to go with my mother shopping to the supermarket. And invariably, somewhere between the Cheerios and the Pop-Tarts, I'd fall down. And I'd be on the ground, and my mother would look down, and I'd be trying to struggle to get myself up. And as a five-year-old with crutches and braces, and just learning how to get my feet on the ground, so to speak, it took a while. And all the time I'm struggling to get up, all these other mothers are looking at my mother and thinking, this woman is crazy. Why isn't she helping up this poor little crippled boy? And my mother had to withstand these stares and these, because she knew what they were thinking, and waited patiently until I got up. And then we went on our way. I learned a couple things there. I, I learned really what's on the bottom shelf at the supermarket. <laughs> but I also learned that it's, it's not always a good idea to follow or listen to the fears and the opinions of others. And again, I think that has helped to shape a little bit of my life as well. As a kid, I had to have some operations. And my mother would read me stories at night. I don't know if you remember uh, The Little Engine That Could. Do you guys know that one? That's the story about a little engine that, that uh, pushes a, uh, he actually shows up at the MRT station and it's rush hour and it's overcrowded train, you know, and, and he pushes and huffs and puffs and he gets the train from Bugis Junction to Paso Reese, you know that one? And, he, and the whole, all the way he's saying, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And I, I kind of embrace that, I think I can, I think I can, I can. And uh, so that also was something that I learned to, to, to own, I think, as a child. And, but I remember lying in bed oftentimes at night and crying and say, God, why me? You know, why am I different from all the other kids? Why can't I play like them? And, and as a five and a six year old, I actually knew that back then that if God took away the use of my legs, he would give me something in return, something good. And as a five and a six year old, I knew what that was. I had this, this little black stuffed poodle and that's what God had given me as a, an exchange for my mobility. And I was very grateful for that. I knew it was a fair swap, and it was like workman's, workman's compensation. But <laughs> One of the first things I enjoyed to do a lot was to draw. I used to draw comics, and I used to draw uh, uh, still lives, and I had teachers and things like that. But the first public mural I would ever did was with my mother's red lipstick on the side of our white brick house. And um, she wasn't very happy about that. In fact, she, they never thought art or being an artist was a career. They thought that since I used to argue a lot, I could be a lawyer. Or like FDR, I could be the president of the United States. Because as we know, he had polio too. And in fact, speaking of polio and FDR, um, when I was in Washington, D.C., as a five-year-old, the doctors said uh, the best thing for a kid with polio would be to swim in a warm water pool. We couldn't find any, except there was one. It happened to be the pool that FDR had swum in or had in the White House. And a long story short, I was actually granted permission to swim in the White House pool. And that's, that's me actually playing in the White House pool. And when I say playing, that's really what I did. I love to do somersaults, go up and down sideways. And, um, and to this day, I love just the freedom of being in the water. Uh, the, 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 it's, just, it's my element. And it became my element more and more, up to the point where I learned about sports for people with disabilities and the Paralympics and things like that. And I had a, a long 27-year career swimming around the world. And, but one of the main reasons I actually joined the Paralympics was when I first heard about it in 1977, I knew that the next year there was going to be a swimming meet in Rio de Janeiro. 
And I'd heard this song about da 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 and the Ipanema and the bathing suits and things like that. And I thought, now this is someplace I would really like to go. And if I swim fast enough and long enough, I get to go. It was a no-brainer. You know, I just, I'll, I'll train and train. And, and I did, and, and I did get to get to Brazil. And I swam all over, pretty much all over the world and uh, enjoyed the travel, but also the competition. And also the, the ability, the, the venue that sports gave me to, to push myself and to do something that um, previously had been denied me. Because before, I was kind of competing with you guys, like in running races or arm wrestling races, in which I usually won, thank you. But uh, otherwise, I was competing on an uneven playing field. And the Paralympics gave me a, a, an even playing field. I like to get around. I like to be in nature. I like climbing mountains. I've climbed Jade Mountain in Taiwan and Mount Kinabalu in, in uh, Malaysia. and. Grand Canyon and Half Dome in, in Yosemite and mountains in N Nepal and India and it it makes me it gets me closer to nature and it gets me uh, closer to God I guess you will you could as well. The fir actually the first uh, the, the first mountain I did climb was actually the uh, there was a pile of dirt next to my second grade classroom and I, I climbed that and but that that kind of got me inspired to climb bigger mountains and. And, I, and then, I, then when I was about 24, I decided, you know, I heard about this marathon in Hawaii, and I thought, I'd like to do that. And I was living in California at the time, and I wrote in. It's not like today we have internet. I wrote in, and I, I applied, and I got my, my bib number and everything. I went, went to Hawaii, and I, I didn't have m m enough money for a hotel, so I slept in the park next to the starting line. And 6 a.m., bam, the gun goes off, and every, you know, everybody's running and running. And 8 a.m., the fastest runners are, are finished. And 10 a.m., most everybody's finished. By 12 o'clock, they'd actually taken down the finish line, and every, Waikiki went back to being Waikiki. And, and I was still out running. And I didn't know any of this, because I was out somewhere in, in Haleiwa or somewhere out there. You know, and here I'm running along, running along. And, and I had my number on, so I, I knew what I was doing. And people would drive by and say, what are you doing? I said, I got my number. I'm running the marathon. They oh, that's cool. And they'd run out, they'd drive back home, and then they'd come back and they'd give me a, a bologna sandwich or a 7-Up or something. And people kept you know, asking me all day, what are you doing? What are you doing? And finally, around 6 o'clock, this, this guy says the same. He comes by, says, what are you doing? I tell him. I say, I'll be right back. And yeah, well, fine, that's great. So I keep going, I keep going. And about half an hour later, this black van drives up. And I thought it was the KGB or something. And out the, jump, the doors open up, and out jumps this film crew, like these guys here today. And they start filming me and interview. So Mr. Burns, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? What are you? And I just talked, and I kept going. And, and then they disappeared. And about 9 o'clock at night, I see this bunches of people as I'm running back towards the finish line. There are all these people yelling and screaming, going, go, go, go. And, and, and by the time I got to the finish line, the finish line had been brought back. <laughs> and there, as you can see in this picture, like 100 people waiting and cheering me on. So I got my t-shirt, my finisher's t-shirt. I came in dead last. I did it in 16 hours. So. But you never know until you try. And that's what I always said. And, uh, a few years ago, I tried to do something called an Ironman and was able to complete that. And uh, you, again, you never know what you, until you try. And my first degree in college was in, in communication studies. And um, I learned a lot in the university. And the, one of the first classes I took was with a, a figure drawing class, which was, had you know, naked ladies in it. And I figured that I should, I should do more art, you know, because it, uh, <laughs> Uh, and then I carried on, and I, I left America in 84. I went to Taiwan to study Chinese arts and calligraphy and kind of learned or tried to be a Westerner doing Chinese arts and did my best. And, and then I took this backpacking trip through China, Nepal, India, and Pakistan, all overland, all by myself. And, but I painted everywhere I went, and I, I, um, I ended up, I met the Dalai Lama, and I did a lot of paintings of sacred sites and, and really kind of in, embraced Asia and tried to do it from a, a perspective of painting. And like, I didn't understand and I, everything, all the religions, the Jains, the Buddhists, the Muslims, the Hindus, the Christians. But I tried to understand by painting and drawing you know, their, their sacred sites and drawing what, they, what was important to them and trying to feel what it was. And then I had jobs. I had to have jobs where you have to make money, right? So I had a lot of jobs all in communication. But the craziest job and the best job I ever, ever had was living on this boat. And it was called The Return of Marco Polo. And we sailed from Tahiti to China making television documentaries. We made a 30-minute program every week. And that was an incredibly interesting job. I said, if I ever have grandkids, this is what I'd have to tell them about. But um, eventually, I ended up in Hong Kong with this boat. I left the boat and uh, worked for Star TV. And then this company you may have heard of called KFC. Uh, KFC sponsored me to go to the 92 Paralympics. And when I came back, they offered me a job. 
And I figured, not bad. They offered me double the salary I'd been making before that, and they were selling chicken, and I was born in the year of the chicken, so I thought, hey, this is probably not a bad idea. So, <laughs> so carry on. So I, I joined KFC. And, but then around when I was uh, 38, I remember sitting in, in my office one night doing a PowerPoint presentation for the boss and thinking, you know, I may be good at this, but I don't really think I'm great at this. I think if I'm ever going to be great in any, anything, what would it possibly be? And, and I decided at that point, when I turned 40, I was going to retire from working for other people and work for my health, myself. And interestingly enough, when I turned 40, you had something here called the Asian Economic Crisis. And my company realized they could hire three people from Singapore for the same thing they were paying me. And I got canned, you know? And I tried as I could to keep my job, keep this uh, secure position. But fortunately, I, didn't, I wasn't able to. And I became a full-time artist. And then I went back to school. I had a very dear friend here named Brother Joseph McNally, many of you may know. And he encouraged me to do my master's in painting, which I did. And it was a great turning point for me in my life and in my art. And so for, then I started just traveling around the world with my then girlfriend, now wife. And we uh, traveled around the world painting and doing exhibitions. And now we've painted in 30 countries and done exhibitions in the same amount. And, and then the craziest thing happened. A friend of mine said, hey, there's this resort in Oberoi Resort in Lombok. They're having a grand opening. Why don't you become the artist in residence? And I said, that's cool. Why not? What does that mean? Oh, just go there and paint. I said, that's cool. It's free. It's free. I said, OK. So I said, why not? And we went. We spent a month and a half there painting and living it up. And then I took a letter. That GM said it was a, big, it was a real success. And I took that letter, and I sent it to some other GMs. And, Sure enough, they said, well, why don't you come to our resort? And I did, and at 24 resorts later, and, and, and one love boat, we've done 24 residencies around the world. We just came back from one in the Maldives, and it's, a, it's a, an amazing opportunity to paint and live in a wonderful environment and, and express yourself and teach. And, um, so anyway, it's just, a, just part of being an artist now. So I travel, I enjoy uh, a, a lovely full life, and um, in, in the process, my wife and I didn't have a baby. We had a book. It took nine months, about the same. Um, <laughs> But you don't have to put it through college, you know, so it's, there's some upside there. Um, but we carry on, we carry on. And, and um, so being an artist, it's about stretching yourself. And it's about doing the best you can with what you have. And I, I think as, as, uh, as time has gone on, my art has changed. I have changed. We all change. Um, and in all of our lives, we have limitations. In my life, I've had limitations that have challenged me and pushed me and given me an opportunity to do things I wouldn't have otherwise had. And I'm grateful for those. And I know that I didn't get to become a rock star like I wanted to when I was a kid because I didn't have any talent. And I didn't become, be able to become an American football player like I wanted to when I was a kid. But the upside has been in Disneyland, I get to jump the queue. Uh, my girlfriend's parents didn't worry about me and would allow me to have slumber parties with their daughters. Uh, this is, you know, there are some real upsides that are, that, are, that go beyond saying, you know? And so in, in closing, in closing, uh, I, I do need to close here, so. Uh, embrace and celebrate those things that challenge you. Uh, I think in the beginning, when people looked at me and said, you can't do this, you can't do that, part of me wanted to prove them wrong. So part of me did what I did to prove you wrong. I can climb a mountain. I can run a marathon. I can do this. I can do that. And then at some point, it shifted to, well, Greg, what do you think you can do? What are your parameters? And when are you making the most of what you have? So then I had to answer to myself. And so I had to prove myself to myself. And I think we all do that. And I, that's an important part of finding out who you really are and finding out how far you can go. And I know when I'm trying my best. And I know when I'm doing that 1% every day and trying to improve myself. I know when I'm doing it, and I know when I'm not doing it. And when I'm not doing it, I don't like myself. When I'm doing it, I feel pretty good. So I try to do it as much as I can.
It's been a pleasure speaking with you. We're all on this journey in different ways. I encourage you to embrace your challenges, be grateful for them, and also for the people that have supported you, like my wife, along the way. Thank you very much.